Hello and welcome to the August edition of Comet Watch. Um, it's just the three of us this month, so without further ado, uh, we'll introduce ourselves. My name's Nicky Vetz. I'm Mary McIntyre. I'm Neil Norman. And we're going to kick off straight away with the BAA Comet section um, visual, visual observations page. Oh my gosh. It shows you how long it's been since I've done this properly. Uh, <laughs> And as, yeah. as always, thanks to Nick James and to Jonathan Shanklin for this. So I'll start it with July the 20th, Warchop Boomplod reports a Kreuzgruppe comet in real-time C3 images. Um, July the 22nd, discovery of 2021 N3 pan stars reported. Um, July the 23rd, and Robert Picard reports a Kreuzgruppe comet in archival C2 images. July 25th, discovery of 2021-01 Nishimura reported, and I have actually tried to image this comet, and it is very, very difficult. <laughs> um, July the 25th, Peter Barrett reports a non-group comet in archival C2 images. Uh, again on the 25th, and Raphael Biros reports a Kreutz group comet in archival C2 images. July the 27th, Warchop Boomplod reports a Kreuzgruppe comet in real-time C3 images. And July the 28th, Robert Picard reports a Kreuzgruppe comet in archival C2 images. Uh, again on the 28th, and Peter Barrett reports a non-group comet in delayed C2 images. July the 30th, recovery of 2005 W3, P. Kowalski, yay, reported. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was reported as 202102. Um first of August, discovery of 202103 pan stars reported. Um August the 5th and uh, Peter Barrett on overtime reports a non-group comet in archival C2 images. He's not really on over. <laughs> August the 8th, the recovery of a 2019 A7 uh, P pan stars as 2021 K4 reported. And again on August the 8th, we had the recovery of 2017 S5 um, periodic atlas as 2021 L6 reported. And August the 8th, Warshot Bloom Pod reports a Kreutz group comet in real time C3 images. August the 9th, uh, Warshot Bloom Pod reports a Kreutz group comet in real time C3 images. And on August the 11th, Trig V, uh, sorry, Trig tri tri Youth Press Guard reports a Maya group comet in real time time c2 images so sorry <laughs> <laughs> um august the 14th the morris hot bloom plot reports a kreutz group comet in real time c3 images august the 14th uh, peter barrett uh, reports <clears throat> a non-group comet in recent c2 images and on august the 15th we had the very sad news of the death of carolyn shoemaker um, reported um obviously we're all heartbroken about yeah. that she was a wonderful lady to interview and we were really grateful that we actually got the chance to speak to her. Definitely. Yeah, a great honour. Um, August the 16th, discovery of periodic 2021 N4 reported. August the 16th, uh, discovery of 2021 P1 pan stars reported. And on August the 18th, discovery of 2021 P2 pan stars reported. And for the hat trick on August the 9th, discovery of 2021 P3. Um, pan stars reported and August the 19th was also when this list was updated if there have been no recent updates try the German comic group page or Yasichi Yoshida's page for information or you can go to the Liga Ibo Ebro Americana de Astronomia for observations that's a mouthful <laughs> I read their page and there's a heck of a lot of stuff there there um, is so anyway, moving on to current comet magnitudes and observable region. So we're going to kick off with 2021-01 Nishimura, which is a magnitude whopping 9.5. That's quite bright, actually. Uh, it's steady, poor elongation, uh, uh -huh. and not yet observed. And then we have um, 252P linear. That's mag 11 and fading. Observable 10 degrees north to 45 south. That's visible in the early evening and not yet visually observed. 
Uh, next up is 2020 T2 Panama, magnitude 11 and fading 45 degrees north to 75 degrees south. An evening object and last reported in August 2021. Uh, I've lost where we are. Sorry, chaps. <laughs> uh, 15P Finlay. Okay, thank you. 15P P Finlay. 11th magnitude, fade, uh, 50 degrees north to 30 degrees south is an early morning object. Last visually observed August 2021. Then we have 4P Fay, that is mag 11 and brightening, observable 55 north to 50 south. That is a morning object, last visual observation August 2021. Uh, next up is 2019 L3 Atlas, magnitude 11.5 and brightening. 55 degrees north to 10 degrees north, a morning object last reported in August 2021. Okay, 2017 K2 Panstars, uh, magnitude 12.5. There is a little bit of controversy over this because the magnitude for imaging against observation is slightly different. Um, so it's bright, 55 degrees north to 20 degrees south, it's in best in the, mor in the evening rather, and last visually observed August 2021. Uh, then we have 7P Pons Winnek, that is 12.5 and fading, observable 10 degrees north to 90 south, that is best viewed in the morning, last visual observation, July 2021. Uh, next up is 6P de arrest, magnitude 13 and steady, 50 degrees north to 65 degrees south, best viewed in the evening, last reported in August 2021. And, of course, we have 29P Swashman Vackman, or SW1 <laughs> as I prefer to call it. Uh, 13 magnitude question mark. It's variable. Uh, 45 degrees north to 50 degrees south. Uh, it is, oh, sorry, 50 degrees north to 20 degrees south. It's an early morning object. Last visually observed uh, January 2021. Then we have 10P Temple. That is mag 13.5 and fading. Uh, observable 45 north to 50 south, that is a morning object and last visually observed in July 2021. Uh, next up we have 2020 J1 Sonia, magnitude 13.5 and fading, 30 degrees north to 65 degrees south, an evening object and last reported in August 2021. Next up is a very old friend of ours um, on this show, 67P CG. 13.5 bright, 55 degrees north to 55 degrees south. It's a morning object, last visually observed August 2021. Cheer me, I've got Thank you. <laughs> Bless you, um, my dear. <laughs> ne next up is 17p Holmes. That is magnitude 14 and steady. Observable 60 degrees north to 15 south. That is a morning object and last visually observed August 2021. Um, and finally, uh, to finish the list, we have 2019 T4 Atlas, magnitude 14 and steady, currently at poor elongation and was last seen in July 2021. Okay, um, as usual, details are usually updated at the beginning of every month, however, may be updated more frequently for brighter comets. Obviously, the last update for this was August the 12th. Now, the magnitude is a rough value for the mean magnitude reported. So that's why I made the comment earlier. Um, about the fact that uh, sometimes when you're looking at a star chart or a planetarium program it will tell you two different magn uh, magnitudes for the comet. Um, one in particular is K2 Panstars. Now the, we have it here as 12.5 um, yeah. but I have seen it also listed as being magnitude 14. So, as I say, it is a rough value, uh, and it differ the magnitude values will differ between imaging and between a vi and for visual observations. Some observers will see the comets brighter than this, others will see it much fainter, obviously. The observable region is an approximate indication of the latitude um, at which the comet may be seen. Obviously, under good conditions, comets may be visible outside this range. This is v visible for the UK, so if it's visible here, otherwise 40 degrees south or the equator as appropriate. Um, the last visual observation is as received by the British uh, Astronomical Association section. Details are updated on the basis uh, of observations also published elsewhere. And I'll be honest, beginners will find comets fainter than magnitude 7 difficult to locate. Um, there are 
information there is information on the BAA comments page on positions and some very good finer charts and to be honest um, this is a personal preference I use the skylive.com and I have mm -hmm. found that has been brilliant particularly when I'm setting up imaging runs um, just be aware that some remote telescopes have a soft horizon at 30 degrees so if it, if it does allow you to image below that you the actual um, quality I, I would say of the image won't be as good as if the comet is high in the sky um, well above 40 to 50 degrees but as I say that's part of the fun of the game that's all part of the game it's all part of the fun of imaging comets um, sometimes you'll get lucky there'll be an outburst um, and if you're really really lucky you'll get a comet homes um, to image like we all did back in must be, well late 2007 early 2008 yeah that was a really good time for everybody um, and some of the pictures we all got particularly against objects like the California Nebula and North American Nebula were just unbelievable and I wish I could still I wish I could find my ones of Comet Holmes um, by the California Nebula unfortunately they're lost um, my the data got scrambled and uh, such is life anyway on with the show um, Obviously, the newest comet we have is uh, 202103 Panstars. It may be visible as a sixth magnitude object, but that's going to be next May. Um, no. So, if for you're you can go on, Neil. It's, it's best for the uh, northern observers. Um, but there's a thing with this because the absolute magnitude and the Bortle limit don't agree with each other, so it may unfortunately disintegrate. A bit like uh, 2019 Y4 did last year. Yeah. So the other, we have to keep the fingers crossed. The other good one, of course, is going to be Nishimura. That yes. is not very well placed, even for the southern hemisphere. I've mm. tried to do imaging runs out of Chile, and basically I've been out of luck because it's most of the time the, the scopes are available. Um, the comet is actually below the horizon still. It's a daytime comet in the southern hemisphere and of course it's poor elongation for us and I think even for the northern hemisphere there are times it's only a daylight comet we'll have to wait but we may get rewarded uh, we endlessly live in hope where comets are concerned oh absolutely um, comets are like cats they do have tails and they, they do literally with them as they please I think yeah. Of all the comment statements I've ever heard in my life, that is the truest one I've ever heard. <laughs> it has withstood the test of time. It's what makes us so interested in them, I guess, the unpredictability. And I suppose it shows now. That, and it shows how many of us are actually cat lovers too. <laughs> well, so the force we don't get, we did mention that Holmes is is in, you know is in the visible sky now, so you never yeah. know anything can happen with that one. Well, yeah, that's an outburst. It, it's like uh, 29P. It does go into outburst. Yeah. E even though it's yeah. far, far away, not in another galaxy, but in another part of the solar system, um, and it's going to be a long time before it comes back, it still outbursts. So yeah. what we're seeing as being magnitude 14, yeah. it could have come up to 13. It could even come up as far as 12. But you will need a good telescope, and you will need to, to stack your images for it. Uh, it it's not going to be a naked eye object. But we may get lucky. Um, K2 Panstars may put on a nice show when it finally gets into the inner solar system. It's still a long way out. And even on the best telescopes and the best cameras, it's not that big an image. Yeah. Um, and of course, I had a word. Go on. I was going to say I had a word with um, Dave Jewett about that recently, actually, because um, I was getting a little bit concerned because K two seems to be um, falling behind with its promise in magnitude. Um, but he, you know, he says what we got to guide this on. You know, that we we've got these numbers and we're picking numbers out of the air for a comet that hasn't been around for three million years. So we're working with what we've got, but it's falling behind. A little bit and i must admit as you know just a moment ago we haven't mentioned the the um c2021 
a one Leonard comet mm. at all. That one is supposed to be naked eye by December, and it should be, well, really, it should have been on our list tonight, but that one is falling behind too. So the hopes for the Christmas comet of this year are dwindling as well. But as you say, they can do as they please, but Leonard seems to be very disappointing. Well, we never know. Something might uh, come, show up without much of a warning. We've had that before. Yeah, absolutely. We certainly had it with Borisov. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had other comets suddenly switch on yeah. uh, and give a very dazzling display still in the, the icy depths of the solar system. I so, believe 4P four, four Fade can actually outburst quite a bit as well from memory yeah. as well. So that's another one to keep an eye on. And of course, everybody should try and get 67P because of uh, Philae and Rosetta. I mean, if, if you can get it, whether it be online, through their observatories or in your back garden through uh you know if you can get it it's a bit of a sentimental thing to get hold of isn't it definitely i really want to try for that one <laughs> i think that 67p is a, a realistic target for a good telescope yeah now this is where it gets to be fun we have to quantify what we mean by a good telescope and it's certainly not those silly little refractors on insecure tripods um, yeah. People try to flog you at Christmas. Mm. You're talking about a good Takahishi, or even better, you're looking at something from about 10 inches in diameter. You're looking at a good re reflector or a good Dobsonian, 10 inches plus. Yeah. And it will need a drive. You will need to guide it um, because you're going to be taking an awful lot of pictures, a lot of images yeah. to process. Um, and certainly some of the really small scopes that promise you a 3,000 times image of the Andromeda Galaxy. Yes. And they have this beautiful Sad. picture of the Andromeda Galaxy on the box. Just not going to do it. In fact, no. you, couldn't even, you couldn't really interface a webcam to it, in all honesty. Hmm. So. Yeah, I think for imaging as well, a decent camera does help. Although I've done a lot of comet imaging just with a 1100D, Canon 1100D, so you can get some pictures, but to get some really good calibrated stuff for astrometry, then you, you're looking at getting something a bit better. And well, another, thing, another important thing is the actual comet itself, because, um, for example, the comet like, K2 is very, very dusty. It's a long way away and very dusty and it's very compact. And the images we are getting are wonderful through the bigger telescopes. And when it does come in closer, it will look great in a modest telescope in your back garden. But the, a lot of the Jupiter family comets, uh, like Vertinen, who came by a couple of years ago, 18, I think it was, early 18, that was a naked eye comet, but it was so diffuse that you needed binoculars just to look at it. And even mm. then it was really diffuse. So, it depends how dusty the comet is as well. A really dusty comet is very good, like Neowise was last year, for example, and modest equipment will show it very well. Yeah, I think sometimes it's it's easier with imaging because if you've got a comet like that that has a low surface brightness, it, people do struggle to see it. I think I may have mentioned this last show, but when um, we had that beautiful comet last year, I had like all the village going out looking for it and hardly anybody could see it and i was kind of looking at it like it's the brightest comet we've had for <laughs> decades it's just sitting there and they couldn't see it naked eye at all so yeah. you know I, I think as a beginner it can be quite hard to understand how to do averted vision and people never give themselves enough time to fully dark adapt and all of that stuff and it all makes a difference well yeah. i think we can maybe cross our fingers and hope for Nishimura to do a nice little job for us. It's got a nice steady trend at the moment. It's not bad at 9.5. That's quite a decent um, magnitude for a comet. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's only, as I say, this was, this was only discovered this year. So. And they got, yeah, yeah, did you see the pictures, the, the discovery pictures? It was actually basically in twilight, and how he yeah. saw that was a comet and not a star, I would not know. <laughs> a thousand times and it looks just like the stars in the same field the sky was even bright it's just crazy and he just picked it up on um, mm. a, a camera wasn't it yeah it just snapping snapping the sky before sunrise and 
That's someone who really knows their sky. <laughs> well, I think this is Mate. what it really boils down to. Um, in a lot of cases, you have to be able to star hop um, yes. because you need to know when something is wrong with the constellation. Now, having said that, you could have a bright nova, novae or a supernovae come up and it will change the constellation completely. So knowing your constellations means that you can already see that this is something different. What is it? Uh, and then you start asking, doing all the things you would normally do to uh, tick boxes to say it's not this, it's not this. You may start doing some astronomy, astrono ah. astrometry. Thank you, astrometry. Um, because yeah. then yeah, that will pick up all the known objects and then it will give you, yes, this is definitely not a star, a galaxy, or something like that. So yeah. it's, it's been a long I've been out in the garden today. Uh. Um, I've been doing my groundsman routine with the lawnmower. <laughs> and then I chop the elephant's ear plant right back to its base, which you really should do every year. So yeah. it's, it's got about a quarter of an inch, if that, sticking above ground right now. So yes, that's been a long day, <laughs> and I've cooked. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you do need to know your stars, you do need to know your sky. Um, it's the yeah. same with, with lunar observers, they know how to, they, they can instinctively create a hop, um, and when, they, when suddenly there's an impact that's a fairly major one they know it's there and they can get onto the relevant people and it can be looked at and you never know it could get you a name on it you just don't know that's that's the greatest thing about this hobby i suspect mm, um definitely if you're the first person in with a report um then or the first of three people you only have, to have three names on a comet yeah um then you get to share the glory but who cares it's all it's all part of the fun and games of comets um is trying to be the best you can know your sky and uh be quick to submit your accurate reports and i stress the word accurate reports must be very well the mpc gets inundated with people who think they've seen something in the sky and it's not and they only <laughs> Chances, don't they? I think it is it three chances, and they stick you on a sort of list where they don't take your observations as serious, and you'll be pushed right to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. You've got to get it right. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of the time that there was a very heated debate going on because somebody took a picture of some clouds with a mobile phone and saw there was a tiny dot of lens flare near the sun, and there was this huge argument over it being a planet. And it's like, no, it's, br it's like bright sunshine. You're not going to see a planet naked eye next to it. But they just wouldn't mm -hmm. have it at all. And I just got so frustrated with that conversation because people were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get my telescope out and look at it. And this thing was right next to the sun. And I was like, please don't do that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I can see why people get frustrated when you get inundated with nonsense mm -hmm. like that. And I must admit, don't forget, somebody actually did report to the Minor, minor Planet Centre of discovering Mars not too long ago as well. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. Yes, very. <laughs> well, did you see recently that somebody called the police because they were being followed by a drone and it was Jupiter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Well, Venus is UFO hotspot, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Venus is or serious, of course. They're, they're the UFO reports to the police. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was driving home. Uh, no, I was driving into Milton Keynes many years ago. And Venus was quite, it was, it was reasonably above the horizon, it was bright. And mm. on the radio station I was then listening to, yeah. people were calling in, what, there's this bright object and it's hanging over Milton Keynes at the minute. And the DJs yeah. were saying, can anybody please call us and tell us what it is? So I called them. Um, as before we had rules about uh, using your mobile phone as you dr drive, by the way. Um, and I said, it's Venus. What do you mean? I said, it's the planet Venus. If you go onto a star chart or a planetarium program right now, it will tell you that it is the planet Venus. How do you know that? I'm an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, have you met me? I'm famous. Great for 
<laughs> people were still having it. Oh, there's a UFO hanging over Milton Keynes. Yeah. Yeah, so, that gets more clicks, though, doesn't it? So they'll still report that nonsense. Yeah, my, my <laughs> comment was, you better call Ed Straker, then. Yeah. Well, I think um, it would be interesting to see, uh, given the way that the public seem to react to astronomy events in exactly that kind of way, next time we do get a real cracker of a comet, it would be interesting to see what kind of things happen afterwards in the the aftermath of it because you can just imagine if there was one with a huge tail like ones we've seen in the past and suddenly that's visible especially like when you have the comet below the horizon but the huge tail still sticking mm. up people yeah. are just going to lose their minds they're just well if, yeah. if you remember we had heaven's gate i think that was hell yes. wasn't it oh, that was awful um I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah, the, I think it was the Great Comet when they, they're ex having all these uh, pills to protect you from poison gas. Um, yes. <laughs> all these comets. Yeah. It was all his ugh. I know. I, I know there was a lot of problems with with the Great Comet as well because people were panicking. Is is this yes. the end of end of the end, end of all time? Is it the end of times on us now? Yes. Yes. But uh, and of course. You get a really, really, really good meteor shower, and mm -hmm. the papers were full of uh, the day, the judgment day is coming, the heavens are weeping, to, as, yes. as we as the as mankind gets judged. And I thought, oh, grave, give me over, please. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to offend people's beliefs, but even even then, we understood meteor showers to some degree. Yeah, well, somebody yeah. has um, discovered that the they have a Geiger counter in their um, observatory, and during the Persids, or a couple of days after the Persids, he noticed that it had gone up by a minuscule amount of background radiation on the Geiger counter, so now he's convinced that meteor showers rain radioactivity down on Earth. It's like, no, mate. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's um, it, it was such a minuscule change as well. It really wasn't anything remotely significant. But well, yeah, this is unfortunately what you're up against these days. And there was a comet that I yeah. discussed on um, Anglo-Irish Astro Geeks. Uh, I think mm. you were there for that show, Mary. Um, and somebody that posted that that this uh, is the Bernstein comet. Neil. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one, 2031 perihelion. Yeah, yeah. That it was it was going to collide with the Earth, and NASA had had lied about the orbit. That's right. Yes. Oh dear. Uh, I I I decided I I I decided not to touch it because no, it's not to. Um, having spoken to people who do end body simulations, um, yeah. to um relax after a busy day at university teaching. Um, a certain professor, a friend of mine in Belgium, was a really, really good at N-body simulations, and he he posted one to debunk a certain object, beginning with the letter mm -hmm. N, um, uh -huh. that, uh, that was supposed to collide with the Earth, and mm -hmm. I I knew him through using SLU um, a lot because he he was he used to do a lot of imaging for his classes there. And we got chatting, and uh, he he showed me that how he was treated because he had successfully destroyed this guy's pet theory that this this particular object yeah. was going to collide with the Earth, and that uh, no no one was telling the truth about it. In, in fact, yeah. the the using the elements provided by the uh, person, the, the the body completely misses the Earth. Because the yeah. Earth's in the wrong place anyway, of its orbit. I mean, yeah. one is going to hit us again at some point, but people oh, gosh, seem to be yeah. in such a rush for it to be happening soon. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a symptom of people wanting to find um, a reason to be crazy and to basically give up, I suppose. I don't this know. is why I spend yeah. less and less time online. <laughs> well... I've noticed in a lot of the um, pro-am groups I'm in, particularly the ones um, 
with Japanese and Korean professional astronomers, it's it just doesn't get time. No. But, um, basically, we all know, we I think the conversation went, oh God, here we go. Someone's saying that this comet's going to hit the Earth, and NASA got the orbit wrong. I says it's impossible, because if it had got it wrong, we would all be bleating about it to the world's press. Exactly. Because we have telescopes, we have computers, we can do everything that JPL Horizons does, we can do on our home computers. We have exactly. the power. Yeah. Um, I don't so understand. It's like, we're going to know about it, we're going to see it, and we're going to raise the alarm if, if it's true. Yeah. Nothing is a secret anymore. It's not all run by NASA and the governments. I mean, if somebody finds an object... We, I mean, we've got orbits being worked out within half an hour. I mean, on the Comet Watch group, you know, yeah. if a comet is discovered, it's boom. Here's an orbit, preliminary, you know, preliminary orbit of only about two days' observation. And yeah. I know we'll talk about interstellar objects in a minute, but, I mean, when Borisov, the interstellar comet, um, was discovered, we were having, you know, orbits within minutes. And, mm. and it's like, well, it looks like it's interstellar, but we've got to wait for more data, and then another day goes by, and then, yes, look, definitely, you know, the eccentricity is three point whatever it was and this this crazy object <laughs> we'd know something Jesus. well yeah. with them it's it's not that difficult a process I, I say that like i could do it but i couldn't do it manually but with the meteor cameras that we have the raspberry pi ones it, it, the meteor happens once and it's a kind of fraction of a second in length but we end up with orbits for it just the calculations are done automatically and um, obviously you need multi stations to have picked it up but that calculation is you know relatively straightforward to model and once you've got it set up in excel it be just plug the numbers back in it's yeah. uh, it's not that difficult really well yeah if, if the, the classic one is Chablinsk uh, which came in from a completely unexpected direction nobody we, we were completely caught, caught flat footed but there was yeah. enough dash cam and CCTV images for us actually to plot the orbit all the way back out. Yeah. Uh, and that's hard, a bit harder to do from a moving camera, but um, and in daylight without the stars to help you. But like you say, the, the guys were able to do that, and well, yeah, it's amazing. We've got, we've got GPS information. Uh, yeah. Most dash cams nowadays have GPS built into them. Yeah. So we know exactly where the camera is. We know where they're going and we actually have an idea of the speed of the vehicle now that, exactly. that's something people don't realize that most dash cams can actually allow you to work out how fast you're going and yeah. that's what allows them to use dash cam evidence to plot back where this particular piece of debris came from um, with such precision yeah, we're going to have more of that. The um, the big um, fireball that happened on the last day of February in um, Winchcombe, um, some of that was picked up on doorbell cameras. Yeah. Because um, we now have, so many people have doorbell cameras and dash cams in their cars. So, yeah, it's good. But, uh, yeah, the greatest thing well, is though we have instruments in our own gardens. Yeah. Just as good as the professionals. The, the mirrors are professionally made um, they are finished professionally the optics yep. in the second our secondaries are totally professional the actual housings are completely professionally built yeah um, we can collimate our telescopes so well because we mm. have access to laser collimators um, that we are up there with Mount Palomar and everything else um, the only thing is we don't have the size I think the biggest, the the biggest teles amateur telescope I know of is a one meter Dobsonian, which is go to, and that's in, in Western Australia. Yeah. Wow. That's and the reason a beast. I know about that is because uh, uh, Black Projects uh, sent me a link in in uh, Messenger about it because he knows he know he knows I've got aperture fever. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, actually, I must mention talking about asteroids and things before we go off it. There's been, an, uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen it tonight. Um, it's, I, don't, I think it's only just been released today. There's a new asteroid been discovered that's orbiting pretty close within the orbit of Mercury, I think. And it's very highly inclined 
I think the orbit's about 135 days long. Now, I'm doing this from memory from a very quick read before we came on air. And um, they believe it's a, um, a, a an old defunct comet. So I, I know I've thrown a bit of a span in the works and everybody's going to say, what the hell is he talking about? But yeah, <laughs> I well, saw it on, on Comet Watch. Uh, Herb Lap, I think, shared it. Right. Um, Neil, send, send me the link, Neil, and I'll put it into the show notes. I certainly will, and I believe it's they believe it's a comet that is defunct, but it, with a hundred and day orbit, it would be by far the shortest periodic comet known. Mm. It's Enki it holds the record. I think there's a Pan Stars comet actually that just beats Enki, uh, just over three years in length. So 135 day orbit, and uh, you can see why this thing burnt out. But does it qualify as as uh, planet Vulcan, though? As the as a lot of the astronomers thought, there was a planet between uh, Mercury and the Sun. Well, yeah, they they did. I mean, I mean, this is like like Phaethon, for example. The I mean, that's like an asteroid, isn't it? But it's a comet as well, and uh, and that goes very close to Mercury too. But we found another one, so. This one is even closer, and it's tremendously. I, I don't know what the speed is in the orbit, but it's it's virtually doing maximum speeds all around its orbit. It's just in a very f- quick loop, you know. Mm. So, yeah. I'm just I, skim reading the article now to see if I can find the speed. I believe. Uh, I think. Comets. Is asteroid. it the fastest orbiting asteroid? Is that the one? I think it's yes. I don't yes, know. yes, it's within the orbit of Mercury. Yeah, twenty twenty one pH twenty seven. That's the one. Yes. So it orbits the sun in one hundred and thirteen days. One hundred and thirteen. There we go. Then yeah, that's fast. <laughs> I think it could be a defunct or dead comet. Possibly, because yeah. I find orbit. I believe I read um, earlier. Ooh, interesting. Mm. It's amazing what what you find out when you're doing these shows, isn't it, really? Because something comes up in conversation, and... Strange that that would be that inclined, yeah. that close to... You what? thought it would be more on the plane of the solar system. It wouldn't be being, you know... So, it's a bit like when you go to the far far edge of the solar system, mm. you've got Sedna, who are in these bizarrely twisted orbits... And I know Mike Brown and um, uh, I forgot the name of the other guy with the Planet Nine theory. Mm. It's very strange why things are tilted in strange angles when there's nothing that should be. They kind of defy the rules of the solar system, so to speak. Okay, looking at the orbit of uh, 2021 PH27, it wouldn't Mm. qualify because this goes out to just beyond the orbit of Venus. And then comes back in again. Right. So he would not qualify as Vulcan. No. Do we know the inclination? Because I can't remember the inclination. Um, I don't um, remember the inclination. It says it's oh. an unstable orbit. Uh, inclination of 32 degrees. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> 30, I mean, Jupiter period comets are only within sort of like 20 degrees of the ecliptic, aren't they? Its surface temperature is going to get to around 900 degrees Fahrenheit because it gets that close to the sun. Um, at closest approach, it's hot enough to melt lead. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, thinking about it, its uh, precession is about an arc minute per century. Mm-hmm. That That's an awful lot. It is. Um, it is. But yes, I, I don't think it's. I think it's going to is highly temporary, um, because going that close into into the sun's domain. Is, yeah, the article's saying that it's probably only going to last a thousand years. Was it? I, I've skim read it so fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's uh, no million years. Within a few million years, it'll either be destroyed in a collision or um, by the sun kicking it out. Yeah. It's been a long time, though. Isn't that? Mm. Well, it's a million years. It's still fairly short term in 
geological and astronomy terms yeah. Yes. yeah certainly in planetary science terms which is the hat i'm wearing at the minute um, yeah that isn't very long really when you consider the what 4.6 4.7 billion years for the solar system um because we've only had like we've only been a planet's been around earth's been around for four billion years so it's, one million years is not really that long no as far as the solar system is it's very very it's almost a blink of an eye as far it's as only one kilometer in size as well that asteroid yeah. so it's um, incredible that it's been strong enough to survive these yeah. orbits and of course the parker Sp sun probe will be able to, should be able to see it as well mm, of course yeah yeah so we'll see what happens but uh yeah a million years is a blink of an eye really geologically speaking it is yeah Oh, how 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 blase we're getting! <laughs> I, I I suppose really, in some respects, that we know that we we can see it in this way. It is a is down to Gene Shoemaker really, because for a long time nobody really saw um, the solar system in geological terms. Yeah. But as as the father of planetary science, uh, Gene really exported geology um, into the solar system at large, um, and of course, it, even even comets come into that aspect, geological aspect, really. So, yeah, yeah. Gene's legacy to us really is the fact that uh, we don't just see it in human terms we, we we actually look at the solar system in geological time as well as human time mm. yeah you kind of have to though when you're looking at solar systems because they they are around a long time yeah. and when you've got a, a star like our sun that's going to live for like eight billion years yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> a lot can go on in that time which, which really makes makes the earth i suppose middle age now um, yeah, because of the fact that we've been around about four billion years or so, um, comets have been there since the right, right at the beginning of the solar system. They are yeah. quite rightly um, what's left of the formation of the, of our solar system, which is why they're so important, really, to planetary science and astronomy as a whole. Because really, to really understand <coughs> them, we're going to have to go. Uh, go there as humans which means thinking of intercepting comets in the inner solar yeah. system maybe from as they clear the asteroid belt um, and come in towards Mars so I suppose the last Martian incident we had where we had to move all the spacecraft in orbit to the far side of Mars because of yes. potential because the comet did actually skim the atmosphere technically um, yeah really means that we would have a good chance to physically visit a comet and mm. understand it even better I'm, I'm not trying to say that uh, the robotic missions are terrible they're not because they can go in a lot of places humans still can't go take Jupiter for instance the radiation fields around Jupiter are lethal to anything biologic at the moment yeah so yes, they 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 can do an awful lot of the footwork, and lay the foundations for the human Mark One eyeball to go there, and I really do yep. think humans visiting comets will be an important phase of exploring the solar system, if only yeah. to get a better understanding. Given the time lag between telling Rosetta and Philae what to do. And the signal mm. getting there, conditions are completely changed. If yeah. we're talking about our, our old friend SW1, it frequently yeah. goes into outburst. Mm. So obviously, any scientific man scientific um, visit to SW1, one mm. person, one or two people of that team, they will spend the whole trip watching for telltales that an outburst is about to happen, so they can move the spacecraft to a relatively and I use the phrase relatively safe um, area of the comet 
whilst the outburst happens. Obviously, they can send a robot in to create to collect um, the outflow from the outburst. Yeah. Uh, for laboratories to analyze it. But that'd be so crazy, wouldn't it? Because I mean, if, if people uh, went to the comments, I mean, we saw this even with um, 67P when uh, Fila was there. I mean, you know, you get these massive, doesn't it? And you see the geology changing after a, you know a certain part of the nucleus has gone into the you know light of the sun, and yeah. it has some radiation on it. And it'd be like uh, there'd be avalanches all the time. There'd be <laughs> like rock falls, and it'd be so dangerous. I mean. For it to stand on a comet, and then of course, like you say, there, there could be a great big fishing crack in this, and then all of a sudden, whoosh! Up there come these icy geysers. Notice or something is. I, I don't know. Would would they dare send people to comets to land on? Do you think? I well, if if you remember the docudrama, um, of Voyage to the Planets, Space Odyssey, Voyage to the Planets, mm. the precautions they took. Now, keep in mind, it is a drama based in science um, so the precautions they would have had to take when visiting and I think it was P1 Hawley they visited in the, sh in the show um, were incredible they, they were really watching what was going on around them they had to be because they weren't even sure if they once they landed and they stepped out whether or not they were going to put their foot right through um, the surface of the comet and that's what it's going to be like when we eventually do get to go to a comet um, obviously it won't be P1 Hawley because uh, of the, the, just the sheer length of time it takes in its orbit not unless of course we get the Starship Enterprise <laughs> <laughs> well, well let's we'll... say even with um, like looking at the the footage of the the sample collection on Ryugu when mm. Hayabusa 2 collected the sample and the surface was nothing like they expected it to yeah. be and it just kicked up so much stuff and I, like it massively overfilled their sample tubes the whole top surface was really loose and powdery mm. and yeah it's one of those things that you can't adapt if you're a robotic mission because you've been designed to do things a certain way and there's a limit to what they can do whereas a human obviously it'd be dangerous but you can adapt that's the difference but well, yeah when you see back these pictures and videos i mean it would be so cool to just be there wouldn't it as a person yes, yes it would and of course we've had the same problem with perseverance on on mars um they drilled quite successfully into the martian crust but the rock was so much more powdery than they expected. That's why they had so much problems collecting it. Yeah, just left a massive dusty pile and nothing in the sample tube. Yeah, um, that, that's, that's the problem we face. Um, it's great, we can go, we, we can send these probes, we can do great science, but we also have to remember um, that we are literally um, groping in the dark, pardon the phrase, when it comes yeah. to what's the surface actually going to be like when we get there. We have no clue. Well, we have a better clue with comets because yeah. um, of Rosetta and Philae. Yeah. We have a much, much better idea what to expect going to a comet now. And I have to admit, in some respects, I think the BBC did get it quite good. Um, yeah. R in, in when they're in their docudrama, when they actually landed on the comet. Um, mm to take samples so yeah. it, it shows you what can actually be done if you have a little if you're much more careful and you really think out how you're going to pre present this science this well this drama um as some yeah. as a, a documentary about how we could do science in the solar system i was, I was i've been doing some research on a comet that passed pretty close to earth recently the 2016 ba14 comet which is believed to be a fragment of a comet we mentioned earlier on, actually, the 252P linear comet. Mm. Uh, and it passed really close to Earth. And they did, it was visible, uh, I think Goldstone imaged it right by radar, and they did some science on it. And basically, it's a kilometre wide, but the comet, when it was closest to Earth, within nine lunar distances, it had a tail only five kilometres long. Mm. Uh, so you imagine the comet with it just this close to the sun with only a three mile long 
tail or so, which is ridiculously silly because the comet, they've realized the, the nucleus that's left over is covered in um, basically talcum powder. It's, yeah. it's, and it's meters and meters deep of talcum powder. So just imagine standing on that and this comet is basically an asteroid. It's, it's basically nothing to it, but technically it's a comet that shows a bit of a cone and a little hat, but it's it's all made of alcohol. Well, <laughs> one, one of the things we wanted to discuss, and I think we'd better get around to it, otherwise we're going to run out of time. And there's been a, a, a paper um, <laughs> that's been written. It's uh, interstellar comets like Borisov may not be all that rare. Now, um, the interesting idea is, so basically, let's go back to 2019. We spotted something incredible in our sky, a rogue comet from another star system. It was called mm -hmm. Borisov. Um, the snowball uh, traveled uh, 110,000 miles per hour, and it was the first and only interstellar comet actually detected so far. Yeah, I say that because we we have a feeling that one of the centaurs, uh, one of the Jupiter families, may actually also be an interstellar comet that was captured. Mm. Um, so, as I say, this is something we've tracked um, for quite a while. We know what, where it's come. We have a, an idea where it came from. So anyway, there was a new study published Monday in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. And astronomers Amir uh, Shirjay and Avi Loeb at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smitho uh, Smithsonian, um, bracket CFA, presented new calculations showing that in their belief the Oort cloud, which is a shell of debris in the furthest reaches of our solar system, um, could actually have interstellar objects that outnumber objects that actually belong to our solar system. This is what they're thinking. Um, it's early days on this paper. I haven't had a really good chance to read it, but I only saw this earlier today. And uh, it's interesting that we've all three of us here have actually eyeballed it um, yeah. today as well. <laughs> I guess we're all on the same wavelength. <laughs> but, and, but anyway, so so basically what they're saying is using conclusions from Borisov uh, they, and including significant uncertainties that... Uh, with those being taken into consideration, interstellar visitors prevail over objects which are native to our solar system. Given the fact our solar system goes halfway to the nearest star, mm -hmm. um, there is a possibility, and this is purely hypothetical, and I have nothing, nothing, no science to actually back it up. It's just my thought that we could actually share a reservoir of comets with the, I think it's the Alpha Centauri system, if memory serves me. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So, really, what we're seeing is we could something could be perturbing their orbits that will cause them to fall into our solar system, mm. or the orbit's perturbed and it falls into the Alpha Centauri system. Yeah. So it would be kind of interesting, um, but and that makes me wonder: is our Oort cloud actually a shared reservoir now? Does do we actually in reality share it with Alpha Centauri? Um, and we just don't because we haven't got there yet. Mm. We we can't really see where ours stops and their the other solar system starts. I don't think a lot of people realise just how big and how far away the Oort cloud actually is. And this article says it's between two billion to one hundred trillion miles away from mm. the sun, and that's a heck of a range right there. <laughs> just going from billion to trillion, it's yeah. huge, and it's so far away. And so, yeah, I don't think people really take that on board because you see the graphics like you do with the solar system graphics and there's a few rocks between Mars and Jupiter and then there's just a few rocks a bit further out and that's just not the case. Like you say, it's halfway to Alpha Centauri. Well, I replied to this earlier on in a, in a, when it was posted up and I, I what my thought was, I, I mean, I, I see what they're saying. And they could be right. I mean, our sun was probably born amongst other stars. I mean, you know, it's very rare that it's just our sun was didn't have any siblings. 
and I think there's a star on like Hercules that they think could have been. So I mean, we could have stolen some of those. But the thing with Borisov is Borisov was a comet that came in to the solar system and shot straight out on a traje- trajectory. I can't even say it, trajectory. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we know that that one was interstellar a million percent because the way it came in and the eccentricity of the orbit. So that is a true and in- interstellar comet. But um, the ones in as it would be very hard to because of the you know looking at the spectrums and trying to get a chemical um, analysis of these objects to know which ones are you know ours so to speak that were born in this solar system or they were stolen I mean I've been looking at I mean comets recently I've been looking at ones that are carbon monoxide rich uh, that basically means that they were born in very 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 cold near absolute zero areas in the solar system perhaps in, they've been traveling through interstellar space we've had several of them i mean we had um there was comet moore house in two and sorry 1908 there was comet humus in the 61 and there was the pan comet in uh 2016 r1 they were blue comets and if you look at the pictures of borisov borisov was blue as well so it didn't get close enough to the sun to for diatomic of carbon and turn it green dust and water so Comets like that, could work. I mean, they even said that even hydrogen could have been an interstellar object. Uh, 96P McColtz could be an interstellar object because it's carbon depleted. Mm. It's, like, it's, you know, it's very hard. What they're saying is, I mean, if we have got lots of comets in the Oort cloud, fair enough, but it'd be hard to... Be. They do not come on, you know, bizarre trajectories like Borisov did, so we, you know... It's very hard to prove what they're saying. It, it certainly is a very controversial subject as well, in a lot of cases. It um, could be right, but yeah. it's hard. And no. I, again, I think this is perhaps the greatest thing about about this particular branch of astronomy is there's mm. still so much to learn. Um, everybody was ch- there were books being churned out by the dozen uh, about yeah. comets pre. Um, 67p yeah. how there's very very few now which are met which are done because this was the whole thing with Rosetta it completely rewrote everything we knew about comets um, in fact one guy I think was revising one of his um, everything okay there something just crashed um, um, I'm still here. I'm still here. I okay, can still I hear thought, you. I swan I heard something, something in somebody's background hit the floor. Okay. Anyway, so... Um, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's the silence okay. here. There's a cat marching back and forth, but nothing crashed. Yeah, I'm just... Sorry, carry on. <laughs> oh, oh, Rosetta. Uh, Rosetta, yeah. Um, basically, one guy was r- revising his textbook... Yeah. Um, which was in use in most major institutions for people studying comics and then of course we started seeing the take from Rosetta and he apparently he, mm. he very publicly said I, I quit because <laughs> every, everything everything we know has now been completely turned on its head um, because we thought we had it right and we were quite somewhat right but we weren't completely right and he says anybody writing a book at the minute might as well just give up because the people who are doing the research using the Rosetta data are going to be the people now who write the correct books about comments. Mm. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it's yeah. interesting that, that, that it shows you what can happen in the space of a very short time. Um, yeah, there are quite a few fast-moving areas in astronomy research at the moment. There's uh, so much going on. It's such an exciting time for astronomy. Well, I'm I'm going back to to school, back to college, back to university. Uh, I'm starting as an undergrad. I'm already having to think about what I want to do for master. If I want to go to masters or PhD, what would I do for masters? Well, as much as I want to do comets, everybody's doing comets, really. So I, I had a brainwave. In fact, ironically, it was because I was reading a tweet on Twitter um, from one of the ESA, ESA people 
about vol about uh, exovolcanoes, and I thought, wow. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I've got a whole solar system I can play in. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Never mind the fact I can actually go. We can, I could actually data mine um, all all the stuff Carolyn Porco um, uh, produced as images um, for the sulfur volcanoes on Io. Never, there's not just Io. There's the cryo volcanoes and everything. It's like, and ironically, it does link into comets. Um, so yeah, this is brilliant because then I could then you could apply what we're learning about uh, exovolcanoes. Um, perhaps to the outburst of comets. Um, in some respects, that is an eruption of, of, of matter. Um, so, yeah, that's how my mind was working after I read that tweet. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, volcanoes. Yeah, volcanoes in space. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, planetary volcanism is so interesting to study mm. because the way that the the eruptions behave is determined by atmospheric conditions and gravity and it's just really interesting. I think there's, I'm sure when I did my OU um, stuff there was a simulator somewhere where you could kind of put in different parameters and it'd show you what an eruption would look like. I know there's definitely one you can play with for formation of craters but mm. just I mean the whole thing, cryovolcanism just wasn't even a thing was yes. it until <laughs> fairly recent. Ne never it's... mind exovolcanoes, and and now yeah. we're looking at uh, exo moons. Yes. Uh, and what could be going on? And we have super Jupiters. Uh, we yes. have super Saturns and everything else, and super Earths. They have they are, they may well have moons, and certainly the ones with uh, super Ju super Jupiters. Um, the question has to be asked. Is there exovolcanoes uh, on them? Because we know that Jupiter is part of the, the driving process, particularly with Io, and it's sulfur volcanoes. Yep. It's constantly mm -hmm. stirring up the core there and, and, and leading on to leading and forcing the eruptions. So, yeah, if you want to get the same into... Same with Enceladus as well with Saturn. Yeah. Uh, the, so, really, there's an awful... If you want to go into... Yeah, and, and planetary science covers comets. Yeah. So it, it's like, wow, I have all of these choices. <laughs> <laughs> I can do do some stuff about comets. I can do exovolcanoes. And I can have a riot. Um, <laughs> yeah, great. Get the uh, get the obsy music track on, up and running. That's about about up to three I think it's four gigabytes already <laughs> <laughs> get settled in with the textbooks That's and uh, there you go so well, yeah. back to that um, paper it will I think it says in the article that had, when the Vera Rubin telescope goes online it's mm. gonna help with stuff like this because these things like you said they, they don't have a light source they're really dark and hard to see so being able to actually get deeper and see fainter things is going to completely change our understanding of quite a lot of stuff, I think. Assuming that there aren't so many satellites that the, the telescope can actually get some useful data at least some of the time. Well, the other one that we have to look forward to really, and this really does apply to comic people, is the Trans-Neptunian Automated Occultation Survey, TALS 2. Mm. And it's specifically designed to detect comets in the far reaches of our solar system. So who knows, maybe it can actually detect one of these passerbys. Um, TAUS 2 is due to come on as early as this year. So I suppose really if you're into comets and stuff, now is a, a very good time to go back into further education. Yes. Well, it's, um, it's interesting as well when you see something for the first time and just like when we first had Boris off you're like oh that's interesting the minute you get a second one then yeah. it's like the first time we find life elsewhere it, it, once you know it's in two places it's everywhere mm. so I, I'd be very surprised if we haven't had lots of other visitors from outside of the solar system and obviously we just didn't know it but I'm yeah. sure we will find that we get a lot more in the future and hopefully these big telescopes will help come solve some of those um, interesting problems and theories and 
say so much that we still don't know about this. Well, this is the interesting thing. Borisov discovered his comet on a homemade telescope. Mm. So wow. what does that say to, say to the people like us who have professional grade instruments what we could possibly do we have the time um, to actually search um, and to follow up on I don't <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did but I don't well th thinking about it well, well, I suppose what I really mean is professional astronomers book years ahead yes, to I get know time what you mean. on optical and radio telescopes we don't if we want to, we can go out into our garden on a clear night, set it up, and run. Yeah. And uh, therefore, we we can take early discoveries, and we can image, we can do all the really very fun things, and yes, we can do spectroscopy on them as well. It, uh, that always used to be the thing that only the professionals can do. Well, now we can do it. Yeah, you can pick up a star analyzer spectroscope fairly cheap. Um, well, cheaper than the other option, but yes. it, it's a relatively easy um, easy piece of equipment to use. I know it takes a bit of practice getting used to kind of normalizing the data and do, getting the response curve sorted and stuff like that. But what's great about spectroscopy is you don't have to image for... 24 hours <laughs> over a period of several nights and stack you just need like a very small number of single shots and you can obviously you need to get a spectra of a comparison thing as well but you you could do so many different spectra in one night if you had a clear night yeah. it's um the capturing the data is really not that time consuming it's just knowing what you want to image because there's a lot up there <laughs> but oh, yes. um but no, the, the price of the star analyzer makes it more affordable for many people. Um, it does, yeah, it does have some downsides, but as a getting started in spectroscopy, it's really good. Well, I think the thing is, though, we've also got most most people can get a laptop these days, a decent laptop, uh, with, uh, at an affordable price. So as long as you don't let bloat, you don't put all your, your social media stuff on it and everything else. You've got tons of hard drive space for your for scientific programs, and, and you can let it put. Particularly if it's a laptop, I will say, this, put it on a fan tray, please. Um, mm. Quickest way to kill a laptop is to put it straight, plonk it straight down on a desk with no free airflow underneath. I was looking. I took mine off the stand when I came upstairs tonight, so my laptop straight on the desk. I don't normally do that, though. <laughs> but anyway, I, I only say that because I've spent so much time in the past repairing them, and it, what it takes, even if you just put a wedge of book underneath it, at the, at the back where the screen sits, you can still get a good angle, provide plenty of good airflow. And I suppose outdoors, really, in a cool evening, it'll help it even better because it'll keep the actual temperature of, of, every, of the electronics down. And that will definitely help you if you're imaging or doing spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it's, it's been a fun show, actually. I think, well, I know we really didn't have much organised for this month, but uh, I think given the fact we're already eight minutes over the hour, um, this shows how much fun we're actually having um, talking about stuff. Oh, it's always fun talking about astronomy. Oh, yes. Mm. How, how, how to get rid of somebody in, in one easy lesson I, I have to say if I really don't like a person and I want to get rid of them I just start talking astronomy and then they just give up and go <laughs> <laughs> seriously I have pe um, there are people I, I don't want to talk to I, I am not a flat earther uh, I am not an anti-vaxxer or anything and they insist on talking to me they're telling me there's a glass dome over the land and it's a flat disc, and everything <laughs> is is false and faked, including pictures of galaxies and stuff. It's, it's, that yes. it's been done to convince us that uh, that whatever is right and uh, not wrong. I have I just haven't got the time. I just I just start going into technical astronomy, and uh, they go they leave me alone. <laughs> In fact, the best 
the best book I have ever that's in the States at the minute is The Holographic Universe um, and it is purely mathematics every single page is, math is mathematics um, it would be good for helping with insomnia then oh yes it's actually <laughs> the best book I, I have for insomnia is Kip Thorne one of Kip Thorne's books space, uh, Black Holes and Time Warps wow it, it's about two inches thick yeah it's it's wonderful it actually explains everything it goes into relativity and everything in a, and explains it very very beautifully and very very easily but if I, I, I know people say oh, I'll read a book before I go to sleep I pick up a textbook and I'll and I can be out like a light in about 10 minutes <laughs> um, I'm sure the author would not be happy to hear that but um... <laughs> Uh, I, I will say that the book's defence it has, it has taken I have read it about 8 or 9 maybe 10 times wow it's one of those books I, did, I just cannot leave alone um, I'll forget about it for about 3 or 4 months then I'll start reading it again uh. because a lot of the time um, the only time I really had to read um, seriously um, is last thing at night so, yeah. with all respects, yes, Kip is a wonderful guy. He writes brilliant books, but I can guarantee I'll, I'll probably be on the 100th reread of that book. Um, but it, it was it will still help me sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but don't let me put you off buying it. Buy it. It is it is absolutely brilliant. Uh, he is one of these gifted people who can. He he's like a David. Um, David can write and he yes. can capture you uh, with his writing um, and you can lose track of time um, and that's kind of reason that sometimes that's one of the reasons I do read Kip because I know that uh, I can pick up the book and I know it so well that I can be ahead of the page almost three pages ahead in my thinking with what he's writing and it does really help me relax uh, the other as I say the other chap who helps me relax is uh, Leonid and I can't remember his last name but he was involved in the black hole war uh, right with Hawking and he wrote some he, he, he has some amazing <laughs> books Suskin Leonid Suskin um, he has some magical books it is very high brow in a lot of cases extremely you, um, but I, I love reading them because it relaxes me to the point I can sleep so it's, it's not that the book is boring it's just that it's actually reading it I find reading high level textbooks very relaxing and it, put, it helps me sleep so there you go get a textbook out uh, I can get relaxed very very quickly and it, that's why I, it puts me to sleep I guess <laughs> and if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea just get hold of one of those um, planet solar system adult colouring books <laughs> <laughs> yes that works too I'm sorry that does work yes um, yeah. Neil yeah. you're very quiet I was just listening to you I mean you know you talk <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No they, they, there's a tip for you if, if your kids need to sleep, give them a really good textbook to relax <laughs> with. And they normally throw it back at me. So, so <laughs> school, we don't want to do this at home. We're on holiday. I remember when my oldest godson was uh, five, I think it was, I was babysitting and I was reading, he loved dinosaurs and he had this dinosaur encyclopedia and I was reading it to him to help him go to sleep and he was just busy correcting me on all my pronunciations <laughs> he's like five years old and knew way more about it than I did but uh, he did eventually go to sleep ah oh, the next uh, Alan Grant <laughs> yeah well, he actually um, qualified and works in a zoo now so yeah he's doing what he always wanted what? to do yes ah. not talk. with dinosaurs though there are no dinosaurs at the zoo sadly well actually yes there are because 
most most birds are, are descendants of the dinosaurs. Ah, uh, that's true. Genetically proven as well. Yeah. So we have chickens, which are from T Rex, aren't they, or something like that? Is that true? Uh, Velociraptor. I think the raptors. The raptors. Uh, yeah. One of the their ancestors. Yeah. There you go, you see, I've got seven Velociraptors in my garden. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to believe that if Velociraptors were as stupid as chickens are, that they wouldn't have survived long enough to evolve into anything else. <laughs> well, the ironic thing was that they were, they were pack hunters. They actually evolved enough to work together as a pack to bring down larger prey. Clever little thing. I think that's the main thing that Jurassic Park did get right about them. <laughs> yes, they were their, their Velociraptors were at least twenty times the real size, but uh, behavior. The behavior was right. They are pack hunters. And yeah. Pack hunters are problem solvers. So if if the the Chicxulub impact hadn't happened, they would probably have formed. They would probably come. They would probably um, evolved into a, quite an intelligent species. I saw something yesterday that apparently baby T. Rexes were covered in peach fuzz and were about the yeah. size of a, a baby turkey. Yeah. And there was an artist impression of it, and it was like, oh my goodness, they're so adorable. <laughs> well, yeah. that, that's the thing. Um, our understanding of, of uh, dinosaurs has got to the point where it's now realised they may have actually had very primitive feathers. Yeah, it's very. If you look the, at, some of the artist impressions I've seen of it are utterly bonkers, yeah, but yeah. they're fun to see. Well, if, if you go to the Natural History Museum now, um, the raptors there and the rex do have fuzz. I'm trying to remember if they did when I went about three years ago. Must have done. Yeah, because when I first, this is going back, eighties uh, and nineties to the first animatronic dinosaurs at the museum they were traditionally skinned if you wish yeah but now yeah. Um, the natural history museum has moved on and has given them a bit of fuzz because that's what the paleontologists are all saying yeah so, and of course then the chicks are being Impactor came along, which may have been a asteroid or a comet, and then uh, we never know. Yeah. That puts us back on topic. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that we've got back on topic. Phew. <laughs> well, we're coming up to, to an hour and twenty minutes. I, I think we, this is this has been a really. I love doing this show because I, I just love the way we all. Uh, Chat. Well. Chat. Yeah, the the, the the chat's there uh, and the the vibe is there if you if you want. Uh, because I'll be honest, the laughter is not forced. It's real laughter. We're really having fun, and we're enjoying ourselves. So yeah, we we have a good laugh together. We get off subject, but I don't care. Uh, I think that's perhaps a good thing that we can occasionally divert down a different stream, uh, and then come back to where we should be. Yeah, we never know where we're going to go, which is great fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that bombshell. I know. <laughs> it's time to say good night. So from me, it's good night. Good night from me. Uh, good night from me. Good night, everyone. See Bye. See you next month.